let me ask you this. Um, what is your story? What, what is your story? This time of year, there's a whole bunch of people around who have just very recently moved in different ways, moved jobs, houses, uh, cities, some other life change. And you know what that means. It means inevitably that whole process of starting new relationships, new colleagues, new neighbors, new course mates, whatever it is. And um, in reality, it, it can get a bit wearisome, that whole starting off again and again, can't it? Because it's the same kind of questions over and over again. You end up asking other people and being asked yourself. If you're one of those who has just moved to this city, for example, to study, then you are likely right in the thick of this uh, right now. Uh, you, and you can almost just send everybody the same kind of mass voice memo uh, or just put it all on a T-shirt. Just get out of the way straight away. Uh, Joe, first year. Aeronautical Science, Monty, Swindon, or something like that. Anything else you want to know? The thing is, though, you know as well as I do that a few facts, a bits of trivia like that, don't really get you very far in terms of really understanding somebody as a person. What you really want to know is how they've got to, to be where they are now from where they started out how they've been impacted by their family, what brought them to, to choose this or that course, what it's like growing up in Swindon, <laughs> what are the things that have made them the person they are, what is their story? Actually, you could ask the same question about a church like, like this one, I suppose, any church. How, how has it got to be where it is right now? We've just started another one of our partnership courses here at church. That's our induction course for people who are new to the church. And so I'm engaging with that question quite a lot just at the moment. But what about this? What about asking the story question, not just of an individual and not just of a, of a church like this one, but rather of the church? How did the church, the universal church across time and across the, the, the world, how, how did that come to be? What is its story? Now, that is a big question, uh, bigger really than we've got time to think through properly today. But it's worth pondering, isn't it? Because for many of us, but being part not just of this local church, but of the universal church across time, across the world, is just a huge part of our identity because we're, we're part of this thing. It's part of us. So to ask about the, the, the church's story is actually to ask about our own story. So how did we get to be where we are as the church? As I say, a big question, but we're going to see at least a part of the answer <clears throat> and maybe even the heart of the answer if that rhyme is not too cheesy, uh, in our reading from the Bible uh, in just a moment, which is an extract from the Gospel of John, one of the four biographies of, John, of Jesus uh, that we find in the Bible. And uh, if I can just flag up one particular line that you're going to hear in the course of the reading, it is this one. We're going to come across uh, this. It's John's comment about what happened for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. Uh, Christians down the ages have taken that line as referring to the universal church across time and history, the, the church of which every Christian is a member and how it got to be formed in the first place, bringing together the scattered children of God and making them one. Uh, now, our conviction is that um, when we open the Bible, we hear God speaking to us. So before we do anything else, uh, before I say anything else, how about we just pause a moment and pray and ask God to say what he needs to say, what he wants to say to us by this word. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of the Bible. 
Thank you that your spirit works again and again to bring your truth into our lives and our hearts and shape who we are. And we ask that you would do that work again by your spirit right here, right now, today, as we open the word together in this way. For the glory of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Let's hear from the Bible. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting in Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. Do you not realise that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish? He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, and he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region in the wilderness, to a village named called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. Thanks, Susan. Do please keep your Bibles open there because we will be spending a bit of time in that passage now. Now, do you remember what our, um, our, our basic question was? The question was, what is our story as a church? Where have we come from? How, how did the church come to be? And uh, part of the answer is actually what we've already seen in John's Gospel. Uh, if you were here last week, you remember we, um, we read about the last of seven extraordinary signs that Jesus had been performing. Uh, they pointed, as signs tend to do, <laughs> they, 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 they pointed towards who he was and what he was about. Uh, we'd already seen before that one last week, what, 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 what we had, uh, water being turned into wine, uh, the healing of the centurion's son, uh, the um, healing of the man at the pool, the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on the water, the healing of the man born blind. But then we came to last week and it was the biggest one of all, the raising of the dead man Lazarus, not just after you know, four minutes, as might happen in A&E or something. No, after four days of death and decomposition, with just a word from Jesus, he was brought back to life. It's beyond words, astonishing. And so the reaction in verse 45 is not exactly a huge surprise, is it? 45, therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and seen what Jesus did, believed in him. They had seen Jesus boss death itself. And so were, were now apparently accepting that he was who he said he was, the son of God. Well, so far, so predictable, so logical. You see something spectacular, you're going to be impressed by the one who did it. But that wasn't the only reaction around. In the very next verse, we come across others who lean completely the other way. Their loyalty to the established leadership trumps even the sight of a resurrection. And so what do they do? They turn snitch. They rat Jesus out. They, they grass him up. Verse 46. Uh, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. 
and soon snitching to leads to politicking. Uh, verse 47, a meeting of the Sanhedrin is called, and then politicking leads to scheming. Verse 53, so from that day on, they plotted to take his life, and then scheming leads to issuing an official edict. Verse 57, orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. Oh, goodness me, that happened fast. From hero to zero, from death crusher extraordinaire to public enemy number one in a matter of hours. It's quite the journey for Jesus. And you find yourself asking, don't you, how is it possible for one beautiful act of, of goodness and, and kindness and love and power to lead to such diametrically different reactions? Does it make sense? Well, not in human terms, perhaps. But what about in terms of spiritual realities? Phototaxis. There's a word for the morning, isn't it? It's a scientific term. It's about the way light affects the movement of living things, especially insects. Moths have positive phototaxis, which just means they're drawn towards the light. That's why you see them flying around your electric light bulbs at night. They associate light, apparently, with, with navigation and warmth and perhaps even food. Cockroaches, on the other hand, have negative phototaxis. They are repelled from light. They try and get away from it. Phototaxis. You can have that little piece of impressive vocabulary as a gift from me this morning to impress all your friends with. In John's Gospel, though, it turns out there is such a thing as spiritual phototaxis. When human beings come across that very special light that God shines into the world, that is his, his son, Jesus Christ, some are drawn to that light while others are repelled from it. It's moths and cockroaches all over again, but in a spiritual sense. Earlier in the gospel, Jesus had put it this way. In chapter 3, verse 19, he said, Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light that it may be plainly seen, uh, the, the, that uh, it may be plainly seen that what they've done has been done in the sight of God. See how it works on a spiritual level? The entrance of God's light, Jesus Christ, forces the issue. It splits the crowd, the crowd apart. Some run towards it. Others can't get away from it quickly enough. Why? Because of their hearts, but their, their lives being exposed. They're outed for who they really are. So that's what's going on at a spiritual level in terms of people's different responses to Jesus. But what about the other way around? What about God's attitude to people? If God is going to have his people, if Christ is going to have his church, it's not enough for people to be impressed by Jesus. I mean, just that is not going to cut it, is it? Not enough. Uh, to make possible a relationship between a holy God and a crowd of sinful people. No, there needs to be something far deeper going on for that relationship to become possible. And the amazing thing about this passage is the way that that deeper thing is explained to us. And um, even more extraordinary, it is explained by somebody who doesn't even know he's doing it. Doesn't even know what he's saying. Turns out there are three things needed for this united international people of God we call the church to be formed. And the first is this. It's a straight substitution. A straight substitution. When the Sanhedrin meets and just chews over the Jesus issue here. Remember, the Sanhedrin is just the, the, the council, um, the, the people in charge. As they meet and they discuss the Jesus issue, their minds seem to be driven by two things in particular. So verse 48, if we let him go on like this, 
everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come away, come and take away both our temple and our nation. And I wonder if you spot the two things in that. Effectively, they are politics and position. Uh, you notice that um, they're not even interested in the question of whether Jesus should be believed in, <laughs> whether he actually is who he claimed to be. That's not even a concern. Spiritual priorities are pushed to the side at the moment. They are just laser focused on the wider effects of people following him. What they see in Jesus, you see, is a threat, a threat to their national life. Because remember, Israel is not a sovereign nation at this point. And the Romans, who are their, their colonial masters, they're keeping a close eye on any possible hint of an uprising or political issues. They would march in and crush Israel like a grape at the first sign of of revolutionary activity, as indeed they proved to do um, before even John wrote this gospel. So Jesus is a political threat. But of course, hiding in the, in the, in the bushes uh, there is the reality that he's therefore a very personal threat to them. On the Sanhedrin are chief priests, that is the, the crew in charge of the temple, and Pharisees and Sadducees, that, that is the crew who between them dominated the council. They were basically the government. So bigwigs in the temple and bigwigs in the nation. And so when they fret in verse 48 about temple and nation being taken away, it's likely not just good public-minded concern, civic duty. Now, if those things go, their own position, their own social standing. Well, they're in the firing line too, do you see? And it's those two realities, I think, national politics and personal position, that drive the president of the council, the chief priest, Caiaphas, to offer this ruthlessly pragmatic solution. Verse 50. It's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. In other words, we've got to take Jesus down before effectively he takes all of us down. And yet even as he says this, the writer John reflects that he's speaking real truth on, a, on another level altogether. Those words of his were actually an unknowing prophecy. Verse 51, a prophecy, do you see, that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God. But here's where it gets interesting. Do you spot the repeated word in verses 51 and 52? You see, have a, have a, just take a moment, have a look. So it's a very small word. It comes three times. You see it? It's the word, what? Four. Four. Easy to miss. But in John's gospel, that kind of language, the language of four comes again and again. And it means instead of. It means in place of. It's the language of swapping places, of one party being sacrificed so that the other could benefit. In other words, substitution. So in chapter 6, Jesus says, This bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. In chapter 10, we heard the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In chapter 15, we'll hear greater love has no one than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. They're all just different ways of saying, well, what John the Baptist said when he, when he saw Jesus back in chapter 1. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
It's swap language, you see. It's, it's sacrifice language. It's substitution language. What was needed for Christ to have his church, for the, for the scattered children of God to be brought together, was nothing short of Jesus himself standing in our place and absorbing in himself the wrath of God in response to our sin. We couldn't fix the problem ourselves. We couldn't pull ourselves up by our own shoelaces and sort our issues out with God. No. We needed somebody else to stand in our place and take the hit for us. And I take it that contemplating that reality deeply is actually going to have some effect on us. It's going to take our hearts in some different directions. One of which uh, is that um, well, it's, it's actually quite humbling, isn't it? We think about what it took to fix the problem and perhaps it finally dawns on us how deep the problem really goes. Some years ago, Libby and I uh, were living up Guildford direction and we, we decided to build a small extension on our kitchen. We'd moved into the place with two kids. We now had four kids. Uh, we didn't really have a proper dining area apart from a kind of cheap conservatory out the back. Uh, and um, we just needed a bit of space. So we got it all set up, got plans and everything. And I knew in my head that we had a problem with our soil. Uh, we were on heavy clay uh, with a big willow tree um, just right next to it. And I, I, I knew from Google that those two things are not good news uh, when you're trying to build something, if you're trying to hold a building still. As I say, I knew that in my head. I knew that was an issue. But the scale of the issue didn't really hit me until the foundation digging crew arrived with their pile driver rig, uh, having driven it all the way from Shropshire that morning. Pile driver, that's what they build big office blocks with. And I said to one of the crew, pile driver, eh? Just um, how deep are you planning to go? He said, um, oh, for you, mate, 33 feet deep, 10 meters. And I said, you are kidding me. <laughs> 10 meters deep for this titchy little kitchen extension. And he said to me, do you actually know what you've got here? Do you know anything about heavy clay and heave and subsidence? We don't mess around in this kind of situation. Now you see the point. It took me seeing the solution to realize just how deep the problem was. Let me say that again. It took me seeing the solution for me to really get how deep the problem went. And that's what I mean about the substitution of Jesus himself being needed to allow sinful people like you and me to become God's people. There's just nothing we could do to fix the problem. The solution had to come from outside ourselves. In fact, from God himself, from his son laying down his life to absorb his wrath on our behalves. The problem just went that deep. As I say, do you not find that humbling? I do. There's me always trying to minimize my own sin, make excuses. Oh, it's not really me, me. It, it, it was the circumstances. It, it, it was the people around me. It, it, it was just a one-off. Who am I kidding? It took a personal substitution of Jesus, my lamb, to bring me into God's church. And you're just the same if that's where you are yourselves. But specifically, secondly, it took a state execution. A state execution. Uh, this is a briefer point slightly, but, but um, important, I think. We have had opposition to Jesus already in John's gospel. 
Just in the last chapter, people have accused Jesus. They've tried to stone Jesus. They've tried to seize Jesus. You get the point. He's already faced significant opposition. But something changes here in chapter 11. I wonder if you see what it is. Verse uh, 53. From that day, they plotted to take his life. Yes, but who is they? Well, we've already seen, haven't we? It is the Sanhedrin. It is the ruling council. It is the government. Verse 57. It's the authorities, the Pharisees and the, uh, the, the chief priests who put out that, chief, that, that arrest warrant for him. In other words, it is those who can formally declare somebody guilty and to treat them accordingly who are now doing so in the case of Jesus. They need to have their man and they need to have him in the dock and they need to get him on the cross. And so we begin the second half of John's gospel, this journey towards formal judicial condemnation and the state-sanctioned execution of Jesus on a Roman cross. And think of it this way. Uh, uh, just ponder this. If Jesus had, in fact, been successfully stoned to death by that mob in chapter 10, if he'd effectively given his life for others in that way, would that have solved the issue for us to bring us into God's people? What do you think? Well, maybe there's a coffee time question for you there. You could just uh, turn that one around. But I, I, there is, I think, a, a good case to say, well, well, no. See, the apostles, Paul and Peter, in their writings in the New Testament, would make much of Jesus dying specifically on the cross. Why? Well, presumably because in the background, there is a kind of public statement going on there that is, that is made about the person dying in that way. As a statement from the Romans, if you were a Roman citizen, you had to be absolutely hideously criminal to get crucified. Almost nobody got crucified uh, by the Romans uh, who was a citizen. They, they, you had to be the worst sinner of all. And it was a statement from Israel. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 21, said anyone hanged on a tree was cursed by God. And you see, those things matter because it was important for Jesus to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. It was important that he became the curse because he redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Galatians 3.13 his death could not be just some casual act of a mob. There had to be a formal determination by the state. He had to go to the cross. But he was prepared to do that. He was prepared to go there for people like you and me. And now something else might be starting to hit you. We thought about how humbling it was, uh, just the, the reality of substitution. But isn't his death also extraordinarily affirming in a different way? His, his loving commitment to us runs that deep that he would go that far to form us into his people. People sometimes talk about love languages, don't they? You know what your love languages are? Uh, was it touch, quality, time, all those kind of things? Well, here is Jesus' love language. Humiliating, curse-bearing death. That's it. You can call it an act of service if you want, but it doesn't quite get it, does it? And bringing your wife a cup of tea in bed, dying a torturous brutal, humiliating death. Not quite the same thing, is it? He loves you and me. He's for you and me. And does not 
Doesn't that bring a sense of security? A sense of safety? As a kid's book I mentioned just the other day, a few weeks ago, I think it was, was uh, guess how much I love you. I love you all the way to the moon and back. Do you remember that line? Well, for Jesus, it's, I love you all the way to the earth and specifically to Calvary and back. I wonder if this week or in the weeks ahead, you will face a situation where you will be tempted to go along with something, some behavior, some decision, some banter, something, purely because you want to fit in. Won't that happen? You worry what others will think of you if you don't go along with it. If the truth be told, you fear they might think slightly less of you. When that moment comes, please remember this. If you are a Christian believer, then Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is for you. He's been for you from the beginning. He will be for you right to the very end. He, he will stay there. He's shown that total commitment to you in the most dramatic way possible. By sinking to the very lowest place possible. Think of that and ask yourself this. Why would I care about those other people's opinions when I stand on a rock as secure as this one? So that again, that's the question to ask yourself in that situation. Why would I care about all those other people's opinions when I stand on a rock as secure as this one? A personal substitution, a state execution. And guess what? I haven't left properly enough time for our third point, but we'll have a quick go anyway that it took a divine resolution. Just so we, make, we get through uh, the last couple of minutes, uh, does somebody want to open that door over there just to li- get a little bit of air in here? It's, it's a bit moist. Simon, thank you very much. One of those things that um, we tie ourselves in knots about a bit is the issue of the human will and God's will. Ever kind of worried through that one from time to time, how they, how they uh, interact with each other? Uh, how can my decisions be real? How can I be held responsible for them if it, in the background it's, it's God who's calling the shots? It's got to be one or the other, hasn't it? Can't have it both ways. Well, there's a, long, a lot of things to, to say about that, a long answer could, that could be given to that. But the key thing is that the Bible does actually teach both of those truths side by side. And it does it in many places, perhaps most extraordinarily, but most shockingly of all, when it talks about the death of Jesus. Here in this passage, we see, um, what do we see? The authorities kind of feeling their way towards what they're going to do with Jesus. But you know how, you notice how in in God's mind it's already said. I'm sure he didn't miss the wording in verse 51. He did that. He did not say this. Caiaphas did not say this on his own. But as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. Prophesied. And he spoke words from God himself. God is the one ultimately directing proceedings here. He is the one who came up with the plan for his son to to die that sin-bearing death. In fact, it's even clearer when uh, we get to Acts chapter 4 and we're looking back to the cross and how Jesus came to face his death. Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Here it is. They did 
what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. It was all them and their plans, that rather unholy alliance of different people who would never usually work together, actually working together to achieve this end. But it was all God and his plan. And so one final reflection on how this changes our hearts, our attitudes, our, our Christian lives. We have already seen what? As we've dived into the reality of the cross this morning, we've seen that um, this backstory of the cross brings us down to the ground and gets us real about ourselves. And we've seen how it actually lifts us up it gets us to glory and secu- in the security of God's love and commitment to us. I want to suggest that the fact that it was God's initiative, God's plan all the way along, also does something else. It drives us forward. It drives us forward. When we remember that he is the one who's been planning our future all the way along, every step along the way, doing all that's been needed, even having his own son stand in our place to absorb the consequences of sin. When we remember that, well, what does it do to, say, our anxiety? That anxiety so many of us have rolling around our heads about the future. That uncertainty, that fear, Anxiety is a crippling thing sometimes, isn't it? But in reality, uh, from one perspective at least, it, it, it comes from a lack of perspective. We find ourselves getting hyper-focused on the present. And so we're kind of like spinning tops on the table, just going all, all over the place randomly. Could go anywhere. What, what, where are we going? But when you get perspective looking back and forward and you realize you're not a spinning top randomly spinning around a table you're actually sitting on a railway line the railway line of god's will which stretches back there and stretches forward there what is a totally different thing a clear past and a certain future when you realize that's actually where we are you get to step forward every day with confidence because God's got it. And let me say, if you are one to whom this is all totally new, if you are one who is just trying to figure out the connection between the death of Jesus and your life, then can I encourage you to dig deeper into this gospel We're going to be spending these coming couple of months looking week by week at installment after installment of the life and teaching of Jesus. And we're piecing together bits of the the jigsaw to understand how what Jesus did can give us a whole new life. Well, with that, let me pause for a moment allow you to just to reflect on some things that God has been saying to you as we've opened his word together this morning. And then I'll lead us in a prayer to close. Our Heavenly Father, we've been pondering together our story. Our story as the church across time and across space. We've been pondering together what that story consists of. And we found at the heart of the story lies that extraordinary reality of the cross of the Lord Jesus. That straight substitution, that state execution and a window into your own plans, your own resolution. 
And we ask, Father, that as we continue to just ponder these things in the minutes, days ahead, that you'd continue to make us more rooted. Give us a clearer picture of ourselves. A more hopeful and joyful understanding of your commitment to us. And a more confident stepping forward into our own futures because of what Jesus has done for us. For his sake we pray. Amen.